this lead was straight and flush. But with the tens out there, you don't want to. Hey, Earl, if you can hear me, I'll be right back. I'm just going to go to the bathroom. If you are watching the recording of this uh, at a future date, uh, you probably want to jump forward about eight minutes. We're going to be starting at six o'clock right now. It's 5.52.
Okay, it's about five minutes till our meeting starts. Uh, if you're already here and wondering how we want to be as far as, uh, I guess, self-presentation, however we want to call that, you want to have your microphones off, but your cameras on if possible. If your camera doesn't work, uh, that's okay. But I need, I just, if possible, turning your camera on really helps me actually teach the class. I promise I'm not looking at your, uh, your houses and whatever. And you'll you'll fully understand why I need the cameras on by the 15 minutes into me teaching. I really do appreciate it that a lot of you are logging in a few minutes early. It really does help us out as far as a technological standpoint. Like, if everyone logs in all at the same time, like right at six o'clock, it has a tendency to get laggy and weird.
Okay, my clock just turned six o'clock. So I'm gonna wait about 20 seconds for a big flurry of people logging in late, just like, well, not late, but it, there, see, see, there they all come. It's very much like an in-person classroom. Uh, people just stand outside the door waiting to come in. Okay, well, I can at least start talking and people can come in. Um, so the way you want to be, I said this a couple minutes ago, is you want your microphone to be muted, but you want your camera to be on. Um, this isn't me trying to look in to see what, what your living conditions are. This is, uh, I need faces to work with because sometimes I'll ask questions like, am I still here? Because I glitch out too or can you hear me, or do you understand that idea, or whatever. Uh, and those are, super, are pretty important uh, for me just being able to convey the information to you in a meaningful way that actually makes this like a back and forth learning environment. It's, it's, it's pretty important. It's, it's just part of why we're doing this via Zoom instead of uh, completely asynchronously. What else? Um, uh, if you don't have, uh, and this is all of course dependent on the tech you're actually using. Uh, if you uh, can't have your camera on, it would be good if you could put like a picture of yourself or just like any picture up quite frankly. Uh, same goes with online chats. Uh, and I'm not sure if mine is updated on uh, Learn either, um, get a mugshot logged in of, of you uh, in Learn because that really helps our discussions work out. Uh, and it, it helps us keep track of who is who. Uh, it sounds kind of silly, but it's, it's something that does actually help the whole process. Um, tech, uh, technology notes before I get going into the content matter, content matter of the course. Um, if you notice that my sound is particularly bad, or even if it's just like a little bit irritating and you'd like it fixed for next class, uh, I think it's okay now, uh, but let me know. There are a couple sound options I could use that I'm not using. Um, same goes with video. I think it's working pretty okay right now. You might see things shift around from class to class. Uh, namely because I'm adjusting my lighting a little bit. I adjusted it a little last night. It looks like I'm well lit on a uh, Zoom, but actually I'm kind of sitting in the dark a little bit, which I'm not super fond of. Um, but yeah, and by the time this class is over, it will be, will be well on our way to Christmas. So it's only gonna get darker. Um, what else? Uh, the big announcement and explanation is uh, do, is needed for our Tuesday, Thursday friends, those of you who are here. Let me explain the whole scheduling thing. Uh, so this class was originally scheduled uh, to be two sections and it still kind of is in two sections. Uh, we were supposed to meet in person at Otterbein. Uh, one group of you was gonna be meeting now from six to nine. Uh, on campus. The other group was supposed to be moved, meeting on Tuesday, Thursday uh, for a shorter duration for about an hour and a half. Um, and then COVID hit and then everything changed, of course. Oh? Wow. Yeah? No? Okay. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is if you, and if you're watching this recording too, know this too. Uh, I am recording this. Um, if, uh, if you can't make these meetings, if you can't make these Monday night meetings because you did sign up for a scheduled class on Tuesday, Thursday, that's totally acceptable for you to just watch the recording. If you did sign up for the Monday night class, but you find it that you can't actually, you know, you can't be here every single Monday because you know COVID did change everything. That's totally acceptable too. Um, if you want to be here for the in-person experience, which is good, and I'm sure that out of, I think there's about between the two classes, about somewhere in the zone of 60 students. 
um, there will be enough of you that want to show up to be in person that will make this worthwhile. I'm not going to be taking attendance on these in-class sessions, but uh, you will benefit from being here by being able to ask questions about stuff that isn't going right or whatever. I do think it is worth your time, uh, you being here with us, but if doing it in more of what we call an asynchronous way, a not meeting together uh, kind of way, if that works better for you, that's okay and that's cool. Um, we're just trying basically to do as many options as possible. Uh, so yeah, um, any other big tech things? I'm going to explain what we're doing here tonight, I'm going to explain the big, uh, how the course is going to work stuff, just like we normally would for any class, right? Uh, and then I am going to go into lecture because this Monday night session is, uh, it is a three hour session. That is what we signed up for. So uh, buckle up. Uh, basically, I'm going to be doing the rough orientation, kind of user manual stuff. And then I am going to give you a full-blown lecture too. Uh, so uh, we're here. Uh, you are in your house. So feel free to eat or go to the bathroom or do whatever that you normally would uh, and come back. Uh, please be aware. And I've been teaching uh, online classes. I've been teaching online classes since 2012. I've been teaching a lot of Zoom classes uh, since COVID broke out. Uh, and please benefit from, from what I've observed. Just know that people can see you, right? Uh, don't do, do anything wild, um, like, like chug four beers in a row or just take your shirt off in the middle of the presentation or whatever. I have, I've seen some strange things. Um, this one dude, like, oh my God, anyway. <laughs> he, he, anyway. He, he was naked in his bedroom and just like, you know, we didn't see anything, but it was, it was far out. Um, anyway, uh, so let me start. What I'm going to do is I have a presentation in front of me. And the first part of that presentation is just to uh, tell me what to say. And then I'll actually kick the presentation in when there's actually really stuff for you to see. So uh, our agenda for the night is that we're going to be doing introductions first. And when I look up and away, that's because my screen is over on my wall on the opposite side of uh, where I'm sitting and my camera is actually on my computer. Uh, one day, maybe I might adjust that properly. So. Uh, we're going to do, I'm going to do introductions. I found that introductions on Zoom are more than tedious. So we're not going to, I'm not going to call on each one of you to do all that garbage. We're going to do it uh, on a discussion board uh, for our work this week. And that's how we'll get to know each other sort of. And that is really super useful because this class is about culture and our experience with cultures and our individual cultures as well are, are relevant points of discussion. Uh, after I uh, do that introduction bit, uh, we're going to review the syllabus. Then we will be reviewing Blackboard and the online components that we're gonna be using for the course. Uh, and then I am going to uh, give you uh, our course lecture, our first lecture of the course, uh, which is a basic um, layout of what exactly culture is and how we're going to be studying culture. So that is what we're here for. It is 609. This is probably uh, very close to everyone we're going to have. Let's just look at all these screens. Look at all those shining faces. It's so, Zoom is horribly artificial, but it does it does help, it really does. So, um, moving forward on my presentation. So, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, my name is uh, Jeremy E. Baker. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I am a sociologist. Uh, if you aren't familiar with sociology, uh, sociology is a social science. Instead of like psychologists study what happens in the brain, Sociologists study what happened between people and what the interactions are between. Um, one second. 
Uh, okay, great. And if I look at myself giving a lecture, it drives me bonkers. So I just turned myself you off. Um, my specialty within sociology uh, is social movements I, uh, and uh, social movement organizations and groups that call themselves social movements. I'm also interested in social change and how world events change the way our society uh, adapts. And I'm also very interested in uh, subcultures of societies. Uh, and that's one of the things I'm uh, incorporating into this class is not only looking at cultures, but looking at subcultures. Uh, because uh, that's a, it's a very intriguing element of our society and other societies. Uh, this course, however, is interdisciplinary. So I'm a sociologist. Your textbook is an anthropology textbook. And I like that exchange of conversations when talking about culture, because sociologists have certain about culture and anthropologists have a similar view on culture but it's a little bit different and I think it really gets at that really rich, uh, rich uh, interdisciplinary flavor uh, we're going for uh, in the course. Uh, so, and if you don't know anything about anthropology or you don't know uh, what anthropology is, anthropology also studies interconnections within societies, but they tend to study places that are not effective, and this is historically, they tend to study places that are not uh, Eurocentric, not dominated by the European world, the history of anthropology, but they also tend to study places uh, of varying degrees of technology and uh, basically the, 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 the not perfect uh, definition I give in my sociology classes is that sociologists study our society but anthropologists study uh, different societies around the world. That's not a perfect definition but that's a good kind of sort of distinction. It's not perfect. Um, moving on then. So, uh, where do I teach? Uh, I teach, do you want to see these slides? Let me see. I'll just, I'll just talk through these slides. This is just lists of things and I'll just read it off to you. Uh, where do I teach? I teach at Otterbein. I teach at Ohio State. I teach at University of South Carolina. I teach at University of New Mexico. So those far away places, obviously I teach those places fully online all the time. I've been teaching online for University of New Mexico since 2012. I also, uh, in uh, Columbus, you're gonna like this one, I teach for the Cleveland School of Cannabis. I teach history for them. It is a really uh, very interesting program they have at CSC and I'm glad to be a part of that. Uh, and it's also part of my interest in social change as well. Uh, why do I tell you that stuff? Well, when it comes to communications um, and when you log into our, uh, my online uh, Zoom office hours, when you send me an email, it's just very important to keep in mind that I have many classes at many schools that I'm trying to keep track of. So uh, please, 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 tell me what class you're in. I can usually tell which school you're coming from and if possible, which section you're in. That doesn't make so much of a huge difference with Otterbein because I'm only teaching this one class for Otterbein this semester. But just when you ask me questions by email or when you log in uh, to the office hours, just please be as specific as possible and please take no offense when I ask when I have to ask the question, so what school are you from, right? Because like I, my world is wild and jumbled right now, just like a lot of ours are. Uh, what courses do I teach? I teach Introduction to Sociology. That's the biggest number of classes I teach. I teach a whole lot of Intro to Soch. I have taught Race and Ethnicity. I currently am teaching Social Problems. Over the summer, I taught an Environmental Justice class that was really super cool. Um, I teach a class at University of New Mexico called Crime, Punishment, and the Criminal Justice System that explores ways that police and policing and prisons basically are busted and what we can try to do to fix that. Uh, and also, I do teach that History of Cannabis class 
at uh, the Cleveland School of Cannabis, which in and of itself is also really super interesting. So now I have noted to review the syllabus. So here's when I'm gonna start uh, really sharing my screen for real and shuffling things around. Um, please excuse this moment of having to shuffle things around. There's gonna be a lot of this because that's kind of the nature of online learning, unfortunately. It's like listening to a badly edited podcast. I can see so many of you on that big screen. Okay, um, and now I'm going to share the screen and you're gonna see screen one. Now I did that dumb thing I hate. Uh, I, if, uh, I am going to be checking the chat periodically but I may not be able to fully answer questions in real time about the chat. Uh, so if something, you have a big question or whatever, uh, feel free to, well, I will ask questions periodically as well. Ask if you have questions and all that. Okay, let me, just give me another second. There we are. Okay, that's what I wanted. Okay, do you, got, do you see this thing that says review the syllabus right now? Very good, that's why I need your cameras on. Thank you so much. Um, so I am going to go in. Uh, so I'll start reviewing the syllabus and you see Blackboard right now, right? Do you see it? Okay, good, good. I'm going to do a little bit of review of Blackboard while we're here. Close that out. Just show you my teacher view. My teacher view is relatively similar to your student view, but um, it's different in a couple ways, but it will show give you the general idea. So uh, you see I have two sections of this course. Uh, you only will have access to one, uh, but you will click on the course get, to get access to the course. And that will bring up something that looks like this. Um, most of our content is at the course home parentheses start here tab. You also will see uh, past announcements under the announcements section. Uh, I am usually pretty careful about also sending announcements to you via email. So that is something I find helpful. And then you can also check your grades under the my grades tab. Uh, however, the vast majority of our course material will be under the course home start here area. So I'll click on that. So you see that big announcement and link to my office hours on Wednesday from 6 p.m. to, a, to 7 p.m. Uh, so I am available uh, to you during that time. Just be aware that I, that's the same time for all my schools. Right, so I might have to ask you which school you're from. Uh, here then, we also see the syllabus for the course. Um, and then I will come back in a few minutes and walk us through, the in, through this other stuff. But what we're doing right now is looking at the syllabus. And then I'm gonna open it. Okay, so there you see the syllabus. Uh, and this syllabus is identical for both sections because you guys are having very similar experiences. Uh, I just note here that I have 10 courses this fall uh, just to you know kind of emphasize that I am trying my very best. Uh, but if I, I'll talk about email here in a second. Uh, so, uh, my name is Jeremy E. Baker, in case you didn't pick that up yet. Uh, my Otterbein email is baker9 at otterbein.edu. Now, uh, let's talk, I'll talk about email a little bit. Um, the reason why schools give you emails is, first of all, it's kind of a step into adulthood for some people, but the bigger reason is that it keeps our communication secure and efficient. And um, it's also a side effect of Microsoft uh, Office and Microsoft Outlook is um, that if you send me an email 
that is not in the Otterbein system, it has a much higher chance of getting caught in a spam filter, right? So I have a chance of not getting your email if you don't send it to me by your order and buying email. That's the big important angle to that. So I would emphasize doing that. I don't have that on uh, this, uh, but I should give it. I'm just gonna type it in, but uh, take note of this. My backup email is baker.1124 at osu.edu. Uh, so you may want to take note of that, write it down or something, because um, I'm not super sure I'm going to get back to changing this on the official syllabus. Yeah, it's baker.1124 at osu.edu. That would be in the off chance that maybe we get horribly hacked again like we did last uh, semester or something along those lines. If, if all of our means of communication break down that baker.1124 uh, osu.edu is my good backup. That's my email that is completely dependable. Um, anything else about email there? I don't think so. Uh, so my Zoom office hours are there. I mentioned that. Uh, the books we're using this semester are Cultural Anthropology by uh, Serena Nada and Richard L. Worms. Uh, it's a brand new book, 2020. Uh, it's published by Sage. I don't necessarily know if there are older editions of the book. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, oh, the Field Journal for Cultural Anthropology, that is also available for you to buy in the bookstore and they is listed in the bookstore as being a requirement. Um, I will tell you that you don't absolutely have to have that book. Uh, if you have to make like a $20 here or there decision, I do get that. Times are tough. But you, if you have the book, uh, please, please keep it because it will be useful to you. Uh, you could uh, use it to maybe journal out or lay out um, what we're going to be talking about because our prompts in our discussions and our prompts for our papers, a lot of those are coming from that journal, right? So um, it, 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 it will be useful to you probably, uh, but it is not an absolute requirement if you haven't bought your books yet. The Cultural Anthropology by Ananda, that is the big important one. So catalog description, I promise you, I will not read this whole syllabus, but I do find that reading the catalog descriptions are useful just to tell you uh, the official descriptions of the course and uh, what we're talking about. So this course broadly examines elements of culture and diversity in domestic and global society as they intersect with structural issues associated with rapidly changing fundamental institutions. The description of wealth and power and the access to community, technological and environmental resources. The course explores the intersection of structure and culture in the real world terms and everyday issues that we often take for granted, such as the life cycle, youth, aging and death, health and healthcare, immigration, and impacts of technology. At the same time, the course will introduce students to basic elements of the social sciences, structure and culture, as we shape them and as we as they shape society's perceptions and examinations of our future and present lives. We're studying culture here. We're studying different cultures around the world and we're studying the social structures that exist in our society. That's the big stuff that we're studying. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going for. Uh, let's talk about student conduct and the rules of the course and all that stuff. Instructors do uh, reserve the right to ask students that violate codes of conduct to leave the classroom. And that absolutely does apply to uh, Zoom environments and online environments and discussion environments. Just because we're online doesn't mean that we don't have to be polite to each other anymore. 
Um, I, in my experience, I have found that sometimes this is a little bit more of a problem in online environments, but I've also found that Otterbein students are great and it's, it's not that much of a problem at all. Really, it's honestly, it's less, uh, it's not as good schools because people don't have as much of a educational background. They haven't really achieved the level of success that you needed to actually to get into Otterbein. So I don't anticipate that being much of a problem with you guys at all. But if anyone asks like a colossal jackass, I can eject you. And I've only in my career had to do that like twice uh, because people were just being real monsters. Uh, please be respectful to your fellow classmates and do not inhibit their learning experience by engaging, engaging in distracting behavior. Uh, this is limited to uh, talking during lecture, uh, not limited to. Uh, I would say uh, via Zoom, this would be limited to, oh, say, keeping all your clothes on and not being that weirdo, um, you know, and other really strange things. Um, it also, though, uh, there is a little bit of uh, problem in uh, conversational domination uh, in Zoom environments, we have to be aware that this is not truly a back and forth conversation that we're having. When you've, you're done talking, you have to wait about a second and a half longer for the other person to respond. Even though Zoom is actually quite good at that, there is a smidge of a lag in our conversations and you just need to be aware of that. Uh, in the, those problems I've had, uh, again, people aren't being jerks, they're just not quite using the tech quite right yet. Um, number four is probably the most important of these. Uh, in this class, we're going to be discussing controversial topics. You don't have to agree with everyone's opinions, but you do have to listen to people and talk to people and be civil, uh, intentionally homophobic, racist, sexist, ethnocentric, or otherwise discriminatory statements or behavior will not be tolerated. It's not just me being, um, this isn't my feelings or whatever, even though it is. Uh, we have to be civil to each other. We have to be cool with each other. Um, and uh, because this is, we're learning, right? We're learning about each other. We're learning about other cultures. And if we just dismiss other cultures as being inferior or as our culture as being the right and only right culture, then we can't learn from each other. That's really the beauty of the social sciences, the beauty of sociology, the beauty of anthropology is that we can approach this from a truly open and scientific way and um, really explore uh, the beauty that is the world. Uh, it's really kind of an amazing thing and that's why I'm involved in it. Um, makeups and late assignments. Uh, this is a policy of mine that has changed over time. I used to not take makeups at all. Um, you guys have a week to make up an assignment. I really, really, really want you to turn in all your stuff on time all the time. I want that so bad and please do that. But if you miss something, if you miss a deadline and you anticipate missing it, please let me know ahead of time, right? And if you miss a test, oh, you completely forgot to take the midterm, get in contact with me. Okay, because I don't want anyone not taking any exams ever, right? I want everyone to take everything. This is a really super hard time for all of us and we're just gonna work together. We're gonna get through this. I promise you, we'll get through the semester together. We're gonna work together. I'm gonna be patient with you. You're gonna be patient with me and it's gonna be great, okay? Uh, I really think this class uh, is, is really super interesting. And what objectives, and this sounds corny as hell, fun is one of my objectives, right? And that sounds so stupid, but I do want this class to be semi-entertaining because uh, if you're taking this class, if you signed up for the class, it's, it's pretty good. Um, after the other student resources, please don't plagiarize. Uh, we are so good at catching people now that it's, it's about as stupid as robbing a bank in terms of uh, the rewards do not pan out, right? So please don't plagiarize. I will catch you, I promise you that. I'm quite good at catching it. Um, 
course requirements. There's a course orientation quiz. Uh, some of you have already taken it and observed that one of those questions is busted. Um, that's, that's okay. I, I fixed it, I think, right? If you've already experienced that busted question. Uh, I think the point total for the course orientation quiz is down to uh, 16 points now, uh, which brings up a good point. Um, if you notice something in our online classroom that's broken, uh, please let me know as soon as possible. The earlier in the week I can find out about something like that, uh, the easier I can make it for all of us. If I find out like Monday morning after a week that something was busted the previous week, it's, it can be really hard to fix. Uh, but, but, but if you let me know early, it can be really easy to fix. And almost everything in the classroom, if it's broken in a little way, I can fix it. Uh, discussion. There are five discussions in the course. Uh, so that comes out to uh, either every other week or every three weeks or so. I used to do discussions and courses every single week, uh, but those are actually, uh, that can get a little bit overwhelming. Um, so uh, yeah, that can get a little bit overwhelming. Now in the last couple of minutes I've observed uh, some people come out and come back in. That is okay. And if you if you drop, uh, if your line drops or whatever, please feel free to come back in. Um, that is totally okay. Uh, what else? Short essays. You guys still do see my Microsoft Word right here, right? With the, uh, you see that? Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so your short essays, there's nine short essays. Uh, almost every week you're going to be doing a short essay of some kind. Uh, so those are typically at least 500 words. Uh, they range from 500 to 1,000 words. Uh, and uh, if you don't make the word count, uh, points will be deducted. If you go over that's okay just don't write me a 15 page paper when i requested like a three page paper that's all i really want but if you have a little bit more to say about it that is okay too and now my little daughter is yelling for me i think but i will ignore that because i'm a great parent uh these essays do not typically require cite citations or references but it if you are required to use citations and references, uh, I'll let you know about that. And some, in your midterm term paper, you are required. Yeah, I, I guess we lost him, huh? Yeah, I think he's completely gone. Well, that's a rip. Yeah, he's gone on uh, my computer, too. I don't know. This is fine. That's all right. This is raining back. pretty hard. All right, so who's going to teach? Gibbs. Well, since it is a sociology class, technically, you could just check. Hey, guys, I'm back. There he is. Uh, Welcome back. Okay, very cool. Um, yeah, when that happens, please give me, I would say, at least 10 minutes, please. Uh, don't just all, everyone jump the boat. Uh, and I heard you're talking to each other. That's totally fine. But please mute again uh, so that we don't get weird feedback stuff. Uh, now just give me a chance to... 
pull up my screens again and get everything working properly. Okay. We're back on that. Now let's get up on that. There we are. Okay. Exam reviews, which is probably where I cut out a roundabout. Um, and let me get this opened up the way I want. Looks like we've lost a few people too in terms of them getting kicked out. Uh, I don't know if you were aware of this, but there were massive Zoom outages. Oh, it looks like my picture. Oh, one second. Okay, there we go. I got it. The power went out in some halls. Yeah, I'm not super surprised. Okay, anyway, though, yeah, there were massive Zoom outages um, across the country today. Uh, my suspicion is that it's because so many classes uh, started uh, at a lot of colleges all at once, and that does tend to overload systems. Uh, a couple years ago, there was a massive Blackboard outage uh, that hit like most of the schools in Ohio, so I'm not super surprised about that. Okay, so you have two exam reviews, uh, one to go for with each exam, you have two exams, you have quick quizzes. So uh, your quizzes are timed to be 15 minutes. I, I'll change that actually. I think I have them down to 10 minutes now. These quizzes are open book. So you are allowed to use your book, your reference material, your study guides, all that. You're allowed to use that with the quick quizzes, but I do suggest that you study them, uh, you study for them ahead of time because you have the information at your uh, fingertips but if you don't actually know what it is, you won't get through that timed element of it. So that, that's kind of how it is uh, determined to be. Now I have to close my self view because I'm gonna go bonkers if I don't. So give me a second. Okay, great, self view is gone. Um, if you, however, if you have a disability services form, uh, please reach out to me uh, specifically about that. I do have a workaround for uh, the timing nature of the quick quizzes, uh, but um, I just need you to tell me about it uh, because legally that's how the ADA works is you have to bring it up to me and then I can help you out with that. Um, and I'll, just anyway, short response exercises. These are worth 75 points. Uh, in exercises, you're going to be asked uh, either opinion or to apply course material to an objective question. Uh, there will be three of those exercises and those are effectively applied information exercises. Basically, it's an op little opinion papers or something along those lines, right? There isn't really a right or wrong answer. I mean, there are definitely wrong answers, but it's, it's an educated opinion kind of situation is what we're doing there. And I will explain all of those in detail when we get to them. Uh, here is a percentage breakdown of how the course goes. Uh, you have your uh, course orientation quiz. Uh, that is uh, worth 3% and you're doing that uh, this week. Uh, we have these uh, three short responses, your quick quizzes, 17%, all of the stuff. Basically, the, the, the reason I show these percentages is to illustrate that everything is important and all of your coursework is important. Don't just not do things, please. Um, honest to goodness, the number one reason I see students not succeed in online classes is that they haven't turned everything in, right? So please do your best to turn everything in. And if you find out that you didn't turn in a paper a month from now, right? Contact me and we can get that fixed too, right? I just. I, I want everyone to turn in all of their stuff. That's super important. Um, these assessment statements that are done by colleges uh, basically are just there to say why we do testing, that important, that writing papers are important, and we're doing that to basically make the academic experience work. This course schedule is probably the most important thing on the syllabus from your standpoint. 
I'm getting a notification to let someone in to find it. Sorry, guys. Oh, I hear you, yes. One second. There we are. Jeez Louise. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, I'm going to get through the syllabus and then we'll go to uh, the other things. Uh, so, uh, we have our discussion. Uh, that is this week. Uh, you are, you have a reading that I have provided to you, available to you on um, our weekly rundown to-do list. I'll show you that in a second. It's called Body Ritual of the Nasarama. It is a classic piece, anthropological uh, writing that uh, is presented to, um, well, actually all undergrads. Uh, so uh, read that. You'll be doing your discussion one introductions. And your first discussion post, I want it to be up by uh, Wednesday. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to get in there, uh, talk about yourself a little bit, and uh, all that uh, fun stuff. There, your faces are back now. Um, and then uh, we, you do your course orientation quiz. And uh, that is uh, effectively a little scavenger hunt where your answers are all over the online, uh, the online environment. Uh, you do a, the short essay, Body Ritual of the Nasarema Reflection. So you're going to be reflecting on that reading and telling me like, what speaks to you in that. And then you will do your comment posts to your initial post that you do on that is due on Wednesday. Now let's look at that a little bit differently, but first just zoom forward a couple weeks to things that are uh, unique in, uh, that make things different. Take note that on uh, week three, so this would be uh, two weeks from now, uh, we are not having class on Monday night, but instead we are meeting on Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. If you can't make that, that's okay. Just watch, just watch uh, this feed at a later time, uh, and I will make that available to you. But basically what we're doing is we're watching a film with a whole lot of students. Uh, I think I have somewhere in the zone of six sections together to kind of have a collective experience. Uh, I think that will be uh, useful for all of us to just kind of like watch a educational uh, piece together and just see that other people exist in the world. I'm not going to do that a whole lot, but I am doing it just a little bit. Um, so that will be how week three will be a little bit different. Um, any other things? This week for communication, there is no reason for that to be bolded. It's just kind of, it was an accident. Um, week eight, note, that is when your midterm exam is happening. Uh, all of our activities for week eight are about studying for the midterm exam and making it happen. So uh, your main job is to turn in your exam once and turn in the study guide for that too. Uh, our study session for that will be happening at our same class time. And then uh, note that week 14 uh, is Monday, November 23rd. And then the final opens. Yeah, so notice um, it's, please remind me, it's Otterbein that decided the classes are going to be officially ending before Thanksgiving. Is that correct? Yes. So that's you guys. Uh, and I think that's actually a super wise move on their part because in all the schools I've ever either learned for or taught from, time that disease happens right after Thanksgiving to Christmas. So that's a very, very wise move. Um, I think that's a really good call. Um, so uh, our final will open on November 30th 
and uh, it will close on December 4th. Uh, see, there is a direct contradiction. So uh, the finals period is through December 4th, right? Our final is due on December 3rd, right? Uh, and that is to account for any uh, technological issues we might have with the final. It's, it's basically a buffer period. So just be sure to have your final um, done uh, by that uh, December 3rd time. And note that our study session for the final exam is occurring on Monday, November 23rd. So that is the Monday before Thanksgiving. That's when we're going to be studying for the final exam. Okay. Um, are there any questions on the syllabus before I move on to the next thing? I can't necessarily see everyone's faces. So if you have a question, please turn your mic on and say something. I have a question. Sure. Um, will that study session be filmed? Like, will it be a recording? Yes, there will be a recording of all of our stuff in here. Yeah, yeah, great. Anything else? Oh, uh, on the syllabus, it has uh, two quick quiz three. Was that a typo? <laughs> I almost guarantee that that was a typo, yes. Um, where is it? Can you tell me where it's listed? To, uh, so week five and week six. Okay. Say here. Let's see what went wrong. Yes. So you'll note that it says quick quiz three, six, quick quiz three, chapter seven. That second quick quiz three should be a number four, is what that is. Uh, oftentimes, when I'm putting the syllabi together, I don't know exactly how many of a thing there will be, and I just kind of messed up. So that's so let's see if that means that there will be, how many quick quizzes there will be then? Four, five. That means there's actually six quick quizzes is the answer to that. That's a really good and observant thing. Yes, great questions. Anything else? I think I answered most of our questions together via email over the last couple of days, but uh, any other questions, any, any questions? No? Okay, good. Okay. Um, I do, I really believe asking the phrase, are there any questions? So uh, if you, I'm not gonna save that. Um, anyway, let us, oh, I wanna, I want to show you the weekly to-do lists. This is a big part of how I organize online classroom stuff. So everything you need to do, uh, you still see the Blackboard, right? Blackboard stuff? Yeah, good, good, thank you. Those head nods are critical. Um, so in week one, you should see all of the stuff you need to get week one done, right? So I'm a big believer in showing students what they need to do to succeed. Uh, and here's our session right here. Uh, so the, so you attend the session, you're here, you're now, you're doing that. Uh, number two, make an initial post in discussion one introductions. And those initial posts are due by Wednesday, uh, at 11.59 p.m. The reason why those are due earlier in the week is because to get those points, you need to make an initial post and then you need to comment on other people's posts. Well, if you don't post early in the week, then other people can't do what they need to do, right? So it's designed so that no later than Thursday, pe other people will be able to respond to somebody. It's really uh, the gist of it. Um, and let's look to make sure that's working right. Yeah, see, and we already have people in there and you can already comment on people. So that is cool. 
I like to see that that is working. Uh, tell us about yourself. Uh, is this your first year at Otterbein or are you a returning student? What is your major if you have one? Also, what is one culture that you find very interesting and why? I am thing that I decided to do maybe two days ago and I think it really is going to help so much. Every single week I am going to uh, have a culture of the week and there still are a couple spots where I'm not sure which culture that's going to be. So if I see everyone say some say stuff, I want to learn more about India, or I want to learn more about, uh, <laughs> I immediately thought Pakistan, which is, they're very similar, uh, Russia or South Africa, blah, 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 all this stuff. Let me know. Um, I'm open to suggestions there. Anyway. Uh, the third thing you need to do, and I saw that some people already did this, is complete exercise one uh, course orientation. Uh, basically, that's a scavenger hunt that will take you through our online classroom. Uh, four, you need to read the body ritual of the Nasarema. Uh, you will know, oh, see, let's see if I can get this to change. Aha, look at that. I made four and five go after each other. Uh, five, make at least two comment posts on discussion one by Sunday evening. So, right, all that means is just go back here and if you haven't already, make those two comment posts. Those need to be at least 100 words, right? Uh, I want you to say something substantive other than, hey, great job, you know? I need you to say a little bit more than that. Uh, it needs to be at least 100 words or you don't get the points which is kind of nitpicky, but it, it is mechanically necessary. Uh, and then finally, the last thing you're going to do is you are going to, to submit a short essay responding to the body ritual of the Nasarema piece and uh, talk about that a little bit. And then next week, we will actually discuss body ritual of the Nasarema in a more detailed uh, discussion sort of way. So um, that's that. Uh, that's what you have to do for this week. Are there any questions on that? No? Okay, so um, this takes us to just about seven o'clock. Let us uh, take a five minute break. So be back here uh, where you need to be uh, at 6.50. Uh, I have, well, yeah, five minutes from now. So if 6.52, be back at 6.57. And I'm just going to walk around my house for a second, just to move around. Be right back.
Okay. I have 6.54, I'll give you a couple minutes. Take this opportunity to check, check our Instagrams. And everyone's vegetables. Okay, finish up that Instagram message like I am. And ta-da. Okay, so 6.57. Uh, let's start part two of the class today. And I'm going to be getting into lecture time. So buckle up. This is what we're going to be doing. And of course, because I started the lecture on PowerPoint, my computer decided to shift things around on me, which is always super cool. So please give me a second. You would think I would eventually learn that these things happen. Okay, which means I need to change the way things are sharing. You're not now going to share on screen too. Okay. I can't remember to move this guy over here. This here. And this over here. Okay. All my screen stuff is shifted around. So, do you see the PowerPoint now? Great. Fantastic. So, uh, this is the start of our first lecture. This will be lecture 1.1. Um, I don't know if I put this up on uh, Blackboard yet for you. Um, I will do that. Let me make a note of that right now. So, heads on Blackboard. Um, this course, is currently being built, right? So I'll give you a little peek behind the wall of academia. Uh, there are some classes that have been built and that I just teach Social 101 the same way all the time, right? This class is the first time I've taught this class. I know all the material, but I need to determine how I'm actually gonna present it to you. So as a result of that, my PowerPoints, my lectures and all that stuff aren't set yet. So I can't post them for you to download them all at once, uh, right? So I'm gonna be doing that piece by piece. If you notice that I haven't uh, made any of those posts in like four weeks, 
please let me know and remind me uh, to get that up and I will get that for you. But anyway, let's go into this lecture, lecture 1.1. So, I, I, uh, my undergrad, uh, when I went to college, I had a liberal arts education too. Uh, you might know the place, you might not. Uh, Westminster College in Western PA, very similar actually to Otterbein. Uh, and we both do uh, the liberal arts thing. And I think a liberal arts education is a really great thing because it helps you explore the world and it helps you know a whole bunch of stuff. And when you graduate from college, that adaptability that the liberal arts education gives you is so important. Um, but one of the great things is that it helps us explore different ways of knowing. A way of knowing is a structured way that humans collect and distribute knowledge. That is a way of knowing. And there are many ways of knowing. And no way, one way of knowing is the only way to know, right? And different ways of knowing do different things. Science learns and studies things one way and philosophy does it another way, and poetry does it another way, and uh, esoteric shamanistic religion does it yet another way, right? A shaman is doing something different than a molecular biologist is, right? Neither of them win, neither of them are superior, they're just getting at different things, right? So, no one way, way of knowing is inherently better than other ways of knowing, but some ways of knowing are better at getting at certain types of knowledge than other ways of knowing, right? A historian might be better at getting at a piece of uh, historic evidence better than a, uh, a pastor or another religious person is, right? because they have different trainings and different specialties. Part of religion is actually a little bit of history, right? But they're, they're different angles of the thing, right? Uh, so some ways of knowing do the same things as other ways of knowing, but there are some ways of knowing that are better at doing the thing, right? By taking this course, uh, you'll be exploring subject matter that may be different from that you are majoring in, right? Or the one you're going to major in if you don't have a major yet. And that's totally cool. And that's good for you, right? To be exposed to different things other than coronavirus, of course. But it's good to be exposed to different things. Uh, it will help with thinking. It will give you a deeper well of information to pull from and problem solving in your career. I can't tell you how much I've pulled from those dumb classes that they made me take in undergrad. I took a molecular biology class uh, because it was a requirement and that has helped me understand so many things because it, it diversified my, my knowledge base and all that. And it actually helped me make some decisions uh, around when my wife was pregnant. Like it, you never know when you might use this dumb garbage, right? So here are a list of some ways of knowing that we're going to do these over the following slides. Uh, okay, anyway. Uh, here are some ways of knowing. Uh, religion is a way of knowing. Magic is a way of knowing. Uh, philosophy is a way of knowing. So is history. So is science. So is, as I mentioned, poetry. So is engineering. These are just all different ways of knowing and no one way of knowing is superior to any other way of knowing. I see some of you taking very furious notes and that's great. These, this PowerPoint will be made available to you. So don't feel the need to get every single word. But with that said, if I am going a smidge too fast, uh, please feel free to let me know. Uh, but I can't see the chat right now. So don't do it like that. Speak up if you would. Okay. So let's talk about religion first, right? Because I'm the guy that always wants to talk about religion first in a scientific way, because that's kind of my sociological obsession. Uh, religion, how does religion know things or get at things? Well, it does that by propagating beliefs, by reproducing beliefs, right? 
uh, they give followers a worldview that can help give meaning to followers' lives, right? That is the thing religion does. It gives meaning to people's lives. It does not calculate the difference between the Earth and Venus, right? That's what an astronomer does, right? It's doing something else. It's doing something different. The basic assumptions within religion are that they are correct, right? People follow a religion because they think that that is the correct way of doing it typically. Uh, and that people who are religious also typically assume that there is underlying meaning to the universe. That is also something that's more or less universal to religion. Now with that said, we're gonna study religion later in uh, the course. Uh, one of the things I love about studying religion is the amazing diversity to it. And the, those basic assumptions, I can think of three, three religions right off the top of my head that those don't, two don't apply to, but that's not really the point of this lecture. Shortcomings of religion is that it can be divisive and it can be resistant to change, right? That is definitely something that religion can do is that it, it doesn't want to change once people believe a thing, right? Um, and yeah, so that's the first of these is religion is one way of knowing. Magic is another way of knowing. We don't have so much magic or magical practicing in our society, but some societies do. And in those societies that do have that level of magic, uh, that is very important in society. Um, it does it by hard mysterious forces. The practitioner can bend elements of the universe to their needs, right? And it doesn't, if you believe the thing, that is what those people believe, right? And part of this class is understanding how other people believe so that we can understand them, right? Uh, the basic assumptions of magic is that magic is real, right? Um, that's an assumption that maybe not necessarily everyone has. And another basic assumption in magic is that if it works, it works. They don't necessarily need to know how it works. And I'll actually address that a little bit later in the lecture. I'm gonna, there's a reason why I selected religion, magic, and science to be the first three of these ways of knowing is because original. Uh, one of the earliest social scientists, a guy named Auguste Comte, he was very, very interested in the relationship of these three ways of knowing. Basic uh, shortcoming of magic is that it's not always logical. It may be feared, even as in a society that does actually do magic, it may be feared by that society. And it is these ways of knowing that are often lumped together as being a magic or a cult or whatever are often dismissed in the modern world. And that, that kind of dismissing, I was like, oh, that's all bullshit, right? That's not really something sociologists or anthropologists do. We might not necessarily believe the same things the practitioners believe, but we try to get into the heads of those people to understand what it means to them and how it's helpful to them, right? And why someone may choose to go to a magic practitioner as opposed to a medical doctor, right? Why they would make those choices. That's, that's something we would study and study in cultures. Now, and I, I got ahead of myself here. I do this quite a lot. Uh, social scientists, this is basically what I just said. I'll read through it again. Uh, social scientists are not in the business of determining if beliefs about magic or religion are true, right? That's not what we do. Uh, what matters is how those beliefs shape how people behave. And in religion, if you believe, for example, in religion, if you believe in an afterlife, you'll behave in a different way than if you don't believe in an afterlife, right? That, that shapes how you act. It shapes what you do. It shapes the decisions that you make, right? With magic, if you believe that you are wearing a magical amulet, if you honestly believe that, that you are wearing something that will give you magical power, your behavior will be different than if you're not doing that, right? Or if you've done some sort of ritual 
early in the morning, right? Or something like that. It, it shapes human behavior, right? These sorts of things. And that's why we, um, that's why we study them, right? As social scientists, it's real, right? It doesn't matter if the metaphysics of it are real. What matters is that the human behavior of it is real. And that is actually quantifiable. And that is a very interesting thing to social scientists. Philosophy. Philosophy is also a way of knowing, right? How does philosophy do it? It does it by applying logic to answering in questions. And effectively, the way that philosophy does it is by thinking super hard, right? By think, 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 thinking super, super hard, right? And through logical um, processes and all that. Um, a basic assumption to philosophy, and this, again, I'm summing up these of ways of knowing in a single slide, right? So I am leaving out a whole bunch of stuff. A basic assumption in most philosophy is that if something makes sense, it must be true, right? That is basically the premise philosophy is built on. Uh, a shortcoming of philosophy is sometimes things don't make sense, right? That's a shortcoming to it. Sometimes it just, it doesn't sort out, right? And if you don't know something, you can't think your way out of a problem, right? That is a major shortcoming of philosophy, is you can't think through a social situation that you're unaware of, right? So, for example, that's why philosophers in the 1800s weren't really pondering over matters of race or racial inequality is because they were all white dudes who were highly privileged, right? That's why they weren't focusing on that because those privileged white, they just, they were at the point of privilege. They didn't see there was a problem whatsoever, right? That's, and you can't philosophy your way out of not knowing something. History. History does its thing by recording events and by studying interpretations of past events, right? So history is not philosophy. History is not science. History isn't magic, right? It's history, right? That drives me nuts when something say, well, it's kind of a science. It's like, oh, it is it? Because are you using the scientific method? Because if you're not using the scientific method, it's not a science, which I love to bring up with political science people because they're not scientists. Anyway, we study history to know what happened. And that's, that's, that's why the, the basic assumption of history. And history, it does tend to repeat itself. It does. Many of the things we're doing now with coronavirus, we also did with the Spanish flu in 1919 and 1920, right? We're doing very, very similar things. Uh, people who are wearing masks are wearing masks in a similar way to people who did it in uh, 1919. Please, 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 when you're in public, wear your mask, please. It is scientifically backed up. Um, the shortcomings of history though, is that the winners in history are the ones that tend to write the histories, right? And the farther back we go in history, the less we know about the losers, right? The less we know about the people that were oppressed. That's a major problem in history, is that those rich old white dude kings and queens with all the power, they didn't want people to write the history of the people who they dominated, right? That's a problem. That's why studying the lives of uh, those African kidnapped as part of the slave trade, right? It's so hard because the slave masters did not want those people writing their stories down. And we see examples of that all through history. Another shortcoming is some coming is sometimes people forget about the past, right? If we would have remembered about the past, if we would have listened to the past, probably coronavirus wouldn't have been as severe as it is now because it did go down just like this with the Spanish flu. 
And sometimes the powerful suppress the past, right? Those who are in power do tend to keep us from remembering uh, those situations when, say, workers rose up and overthrew the rich and redistributed wealth, those sorts of things. Another way of knowing is science. Science is a good way of knowing, but not inherently better because there is no inherently better way of knowing. Science does it by asking questions and answering those questions based on observable reality. Now, science, that thing, asking questions and answering those questions based on observ observable reality, that is a statement of philosophy, right? Because, and we'll talk about this a little in about 20 minutes maybe, Science is based on philosophy. It's driven by a philosophy that you can observe things that are actually occurring in the world, right? And when you observe things that are occurring in the world, you will get a more concrete thing than if you just stare at a wall and think real hard, right? That's a philosophical thing. So the basic... Uh, uh, assumption of science is that if it can be observed, we can understand it, right? So when science adv advances, we're always pushing to advance more and observe more and more and more stuff, right? That's why we make super strong, um, super strong telescopes. That's why we make super strong microscopes, right? That's why we make different ways of observing things because we want to observe all the stuff. A shortcoming of science though, is that if it cannot be observed, we, it's hard to study, right? And that's one of the major difficulties actually of social sciences is because there are some things that can't be observed or are very difficult to observe, like, like love, right? Love is hard to observe, right? You can watch parents taking care of children. You can watch uh, people uh, who love each other romantically, but all we can observe really is those behaviors. We usually can't gauge those feelings. Now, Psychologists have made really amazing advances in studying brain waves and what happens in the brain when you see someone who loves you. you. You can see that sort of stuff too, but is the natural setting of seeing someone you love in your kitchen different than the setting of being hooked up to all sort of nodes and wires and being shown a picture of your mother? Are those different things? it's hard to observe, right? So, so, um, so yeah, that, that's one of the shortcomings of science. Another shortcoming of science is that scientists, we have a bad PR in looking super indecisive to non-scientists. Scientists are trained to not say, I absolutely know this thing, right? We're really actually kind of discouraged from saying stuff like that. And that can make us a look a little bit weak. Um, so let's talk more about what makes science so special. The big thing that makes something science is the scientific method. And if you've ever studied this before, you probably studied this in a chemistry class or a physics class in high school, the scientific method. And this is the same thing, right? But we do it in a slightly different way in the social sciences. So the scientific method is, are these stages of observe, observation and the question, then you do a little bit of research. So what does that mean? Research in so science, I'm gonna take that back. I actually don't like how this is listed. This is usually called a literature review, right? What we often think of as research, this is me going off script because my slide's slightly messed up. Uh, what we think of as research in our day-to-day -day life, right? You're Googling something, you're Wikipedia something, something like that. That is what scientists call literature review. Now, research in science is 
creating new knowledge. Right? So if I am going to sociologically study someone, let's say I want to find out what's happening at uh, a local uh, gay bar, right? So I'll do my literature review in the in this phase, right? I'll read up on uh, the literature on the LGBT community and what's happening there and how they're dealing with coronavirus and all that sort of stuff, right? That is the literature review. And then when I actually go down there and I observe and I take pictures or I record the environment or I gather information down there, that's the research, right? That's what scientists call the research. It's the creating of the new knowledge. That's scientific research. Does that make sense? That's a big concept. That's a super big concept. Anyway, though, then we develop a hypothesis, which a hypothesis is a statement of, this is how I think the thing is, is going to happen. It's my prediction. It's based on what you know about the world. So my hypothesis about the local gay bar would be that there are fewer people in that bar now than there were prior to COVID, right? That would be my guess. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that would be accurate, right? Uh, so that's a hypothesis. Then we could do an experiment or we could do an observation, right? That's why this, this one isn't perfect either. I really should have picked a much better illustration. Uh, you can observe too. You can uh, do Bunsen beakers and observe people, but you can also do those experiments. Then you collect the data, right? Uh, you do the observation. Then you do uh, the analysis, which is examining the data, and then you write your conclusion. Um, the reason why we go through the scientific method stuff is that people need to understand how you did the thing, right? We do science in the name of transparency and in the name of getting to the bottom of the objective truth, right? This and that, getting to the bottom of it and showing you exactly how we did it makes societal advancement possible because we're doing it based off facts, right? And we're doing it based off, it's, it's very democratic too, with a lowercase d. Not talking about the Democratic Party, right? Talking about a way that a democracy should do things. Democracy should be based on science because we're talking about objective facts and acting on objective facts so that everyone can know what's happening. Another great thing about science is that it makes evidence-based practice possible. I am a big fan of teaching based off evidence-based practice. The definition for that is doing things, i.e. practice, right? Doing things based on scientific evidence, right? An example of that is medicine, right? Doctors in the modern world are off of evidence-based practice. They treat you based on scientific proof that a treatment is effective, right? Uh, they don't treat you based off, well, that's how the doctor's grandmother always used to do it, right? So instead of you getting a bad cut and putting mayonnaise on it like that person's grandmother would have, they put antibiotics on it because those are scientifically proven to help the cut heal faster because there was research, there were trials, and to make that all sort out. Does that make sense? That's why we do science. It makes evidence-based practice possible. I base some of my teaching, I base my teaching strategies on evidence-based practice. That's why I give you your study guides because when students do their study guides, those students that do them, I see a five to 10% increase on the actual um, uh, scores on the test, right? That's why I do those study guides. I actually don't check the study guides for accuracy, right? Because honestly, I don't, I, 
I want you to do the work. I don't care if you're accurate. It'll reflect, you'll get punished on the test if you're not right, right? So like, it, it, it's a practice kind of thing. Now an important way part, let me look at my next slide. Yeah, an important part of science is knowing when you don't know something. And this can be where a lot of the frustration with scientists come from, right? Is knowing when you don't know something and admitting when you're wrong about not knowing something. Now, unfortunately, a lot of our society sees that as weakness. It's like, oh, you're stupid. Oh, you don't know. Oh, you're indecisive, right? Sometimes scientists get that thrown at them. If a scientist can't tell you how they did something or how it happened, they'll just say, well, we don't know, right? Or we may be working on it. And we saw a lot of that in February and March and April surrounding coronavirus, didn't we? People saying, know what they're talking about. Oh, nobody knows what they're talking about. They told us not to wear masks this week, but they tell us to wear masks this week, but they tell us to wear a certain kind of masks this week. Oh, they don't know anything. Well, they didn't know anything. But today in uh, September 2020, we know a hell of a lot more than we knew in January of 2020 because we have done a colossal amount of scientific research between now and then. Um, if you dig into the actual science and the research that has gone into studying coronavirus, it is boggling and it may sound to be one of the major achievements of human society, like globally, the, the vaccine or vaccines that we come up for this thing, because like we are going at a breakneck speed in a way scientifically that is very impressive. So when you, that vaccine gets out, get it, please, <laughs> please, please. Um, how ways of knowing work? Uh, the most common thought of sciences are the physical sciences. So this is talking a little bit more about science. So stuff like physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy, entomology, that's the study of bugs, geology, right? All those ologies, uh, when you had science class in elementary school, that's probably uh, what you thought of, right? Unfortunate, you know, I would love to see more social sciences in elementary schools. Um, yeah, anyway, that's just me. So, social sciences are also science though. I always point that out because we also use that same scientific method. We use those same stages. We do those literature reviews. We do have hypotheses. Uh, we operationalize variables. We do all that same stuff. So sociologists uh, over here, this is what, you, what we call a network analysis. So each of these points is a people and each of these colors are clusters of groups of people. Uh, and this would be another cluster and this would be another cluster. Uh, one way you could study this, uh, you could use these to study something like uh, a terrorist network or political parties or how people are expected to vote or how uh, coronavirus is outbreaking, right? This kind of stuff, uh, network analysis is actually very, very important stuff. And it's, it's social science. Um, anthropology uh, is also a, a social science. We have an image uh, from South America of a dig site. Uh, archaeology, if you're uh, wondering the distinction there, archaeology is effectively anthropology of the past. Um, psychology, uh, also a social science and mapping out the human brain, but also economics is also a social science. It's actually the only social science uh, that you can get a Nobel Prize for, which is kind of garbage, but whatever. Um, and then linguistics is also another social science there. So uh, sometimes social science, scientific findings, so this is a really super important thing to know about social science. Social scientific findings are mistaken for opinion, but the difference is that science is backed up by data and opinion is not, 
right? My mother has said to me repeatedly, it's like, well, that's just your opinion, Jeremy. It's like, no, it isn't. There's science to back this thing up. It's actually science. I have that opinion, but it's backed up by science. So an example can be things like racist attitudes at work. The opinion one that I have labeled uh, with a racist right here, because it is a racist opinion, Mexicans are lazy. That can be somebody's opinion. You can have the opinion, please don't have the opinion because it's racist, Mexicans are lazy. Well, someone else can have the opinion, Mexicans are not lazy. Those are two different opinions, right? Social scientific data shows that when looking at people of different ethnicities in similar industries, people of Mexican descent working similar hours to their counterparts uh, work similar hours to their different ethnicities. What does that mean? It means Mexicans work as much, same productivity as other people. What does that mean? It means that opinion two, this is the opinion of opinion two person. Opinion two is backed up by scientific data while opinion one is not. Some opinions are objectively wrong, right? That's the of social science is that some opinions are wrong. Some opinions that surround things that people vote about are scientifically wrong. That's a really fun slide to go over. It's true. In social science, we must be careful though, with that said, right? So we do study things that people feel passionately about. We do study things that people have opinions about, right? So when doing social science, it is super important to leave our opinions out of that, right? To actually get the real data of it and to get to the truth of the matter, the scientific truth of the matter, right? So that it doesn't cloud that. Worldviews, this actually should probably be two different slides. There, there should probably be a distinction here. This should be two different slides. Uh, Worldviews do sometimes get in the way of that. Worldviews are our underlying assumptions that guide our lives. These can include things like politics, right? Your political perspective, that's part of your worldview. Uh, your religious beliefs. Religious beliefs don't necessarily sync up with your political beliefs. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. That makes up your worldview. Your personal philosophies, right, that you hold, the things that you believe, how you live your life, whether you want to have children or not, whether you want to get married or not, how you want to get married, all of that, all of those things, they make up your worldview. And a lot of you might still be your worldviews, right? Because uh, you are, everyone in this class is an adult, but you're, you're pretty, you've only been an adult a couple years, right? So you're still, you're still, you're still building and you're still flexible, but I'm also still building and I'm also still flexible too. And um, we, we're, we're all still learning things. Okay, any, this is kind of a, a shifting point in the lecture. Does anyone have any questions? Looking through my, oh, I think I see one. Uh, quick, yeah. quick question. Uh, was there any particular reason uh, on the ways of knowing that we focus most, mainly on science? Um, because, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, namely, because this is a science class. That's why I really wanted to drive that home. Uh, but, you know, other ways of knowing, though, are absolutely um, valid but we're using science most in this class. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, great. Anything else? Yeah, what, what are the main ways that social scientists collect data? Oh, cool. Um, we do, we do, do it in a lot of, who was that? Was that Ben? Yeah. Hey, Ben. Um, I, I have your name. Oh, another thing noted here. Uh, and I, I haven't had this so much at Otterbun, but please use uh, your name uh, when you sign into Zoom because when people have things like uh, Killer Marine 85, because that's 
uh, how they are on Halo or something, it really screws everything up. Anyway, though, um, oh, geez, we use a lot of things. Uh, Is this we, just like surveys or survey? like you have to talk to people, right? Sir, well, you don't necessarily. I know some downright antisocial sociologists that don't actually use surveys. Um, we can use surveys. We can use uh, something I call we call content analysis. You can just look at books from a long time ago. Uh, you can uh, use brain scans if you're a psychologist. Uh, if you're an archaeologist, you can go out in the field and dig stuff up. Uh, we have a whole, whole, whole lot of scientific methods at our disposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. We can do experiments. Um, we don't rely on experiments the way uh, disciplines like chemistry or physics do. They do most of their studying through experiments. Um, sociologists in general are philosophically minded as such that we don't really believe that the social world exists in an experimental setting. We think that's kind of fake and it's not actually how it actually is. Uh, so we tend to observe a whole lot more. A major, um, a major scientific tool within sociology is observation and watching people. And that is actually very similar to anthropology as well. We both do that. Uh, psychologists are a lot bigger on uh, uh, experimentation. Great question. Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, is epidemiology a physical science or a social science? Epidemiology? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. It's a little bit of both. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, I think epidemiology absolutely studies the spread of the disease, but how people interact with each other, there is a, there's a layering there. So I would say it's a little bit of both. That's a great question. But also with that said, psychology also has a degree of natural science element to that there too, right? Uh, because they study, uh, some psychologists study brain chemistry and, and that's a question. Anything else? Looking at my faces. Okay, I don't see anything else. It's so nice to see different faces as opposed to like the same six I just see in my neighborhood. Um, cool. So moving on to the next part. What is culture? Because that's what this class is. This class is culture, right? Is, is the study of culture. And if we're gonna study culture for the whole class, we should probably address that in day one, right? So culture, this is your definition for culture. Culture is the total set of behaviors and objects that make up a way of life or a group of people. That's what culture is. That's what we're studying. We're studying the total set of behaviors and objects that make up a way of life or group of people. Culture includes, but is not limited to, language, values, norms. You probably don't know what values or norms are yet. We'll talk about those in a second. Physical artifacts, beliefs, knowledge, what is considered knowledge, understandings, opinions. One thing to point out is that knowledge, that culture is not always fancy, right? Culture is not always to be cultured or to, to be super, super duper fancy. So I pulled this from a Google search of uh, Italian opera, right? Because we think of Italian opera as just being the fanciest thing on the planet, right? Well, yes, Italian opera does reflect certain elements of culture, but stoner weed culture also reflects culture. It's just different. It's different cultures. It's actually a specific subculture, right? That's what we're looking at there. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the thing that's super fancy, right? I'm sure that um, hopeless 
crack addicts in Philadelphia in the inner city, they also have culture, right? It's just not necessarily the kind of thing that people will pay $500 for a balcony seat for. Similarly though, uh, Guy Fieri and the conversation about changing Columbus is named to Flavortown that I'm not necessarily against because I think it would be fun that's also a conversation about culture. And the fact that we even entertained that for a brief second really says so much about American culture that we would think, oh, that's dumb. Oh, but wait a minute, maybe, right? Like that's also culture. And it also says that we are changing as a society too. And I think Flavortown is a much better name than the name of a fucking genocidal madman, right? Who, who Christopher Columbus absolutely was, right? Uh, I would also be in favor, uh, side note, of changing the name of Columbus to Capital City. I think that would be fine. Ohio City would be fine. I could list off different names uh, of this town all day. But, you know, people don't want to change their stationery. Um, so, values. We need to define these things, right? So a value is an abstract belief that society possesses. That's what a value is. For example, in general, in our society, we value human life. I know it sometimes doesn't feel that way, but in general, we all agree that everyone should be allowed to keep living, right? That's, that's kind of a commonality. Norms then are the specific rules associated with values. So values are vague, right? But norms are specific, right? So because we value human life, we set rules, we set norms that protect personal safety, right? So these slow down, save a life things, it's telling you how to follow a rule, right? But it's also an, ex it shows you how to follow a norm, but it's also an expression of a value. Does that make sense? Those are super easy terms to confuse but it is a very important distinction. Law, now there are different types of norms, right? So a law and a folkway, those are both types of norms. Laws are norms that become official and codified with official punishments or rewards. All codified means is written down, right? It becomes the code. So for example, it is illegal to kill people and you could be executed for doing it, right? So we write down in the laws that we don't kill people based off the value of thinking human life is good. And the official punishment for that could be either a very long or lifelong prison sentence uh, or uh, potentially execution. A folkway then is a loosely enforced rule that exists mostly to make day to day a little bit more comfortable for others. So these are our manners, right? That's what folkways are, right? It's things we do to make life a little bit easier, to make society a little bit better. If, so, if an old person is trying to get through a door, you hold the door open for them to let them through. Or someone carrying a lot of packages, you, you do that to let them through, right? What is the worst punishment you could get for that? Well, maybe they could yell, you know, what's up, asshole, right? Something like that, right? That's something that they could do. That would be a, the, as most of that punishment would get, right? That makes sense? That distinction there? Good, good, good. So folk wisdom, this is something else. Folk wisdom are beliefs held by a group of people. Now folk wisdom is sometimes called common sense and common sense is not based on science, right? It's just ideas that we have that we have. 
folk wisdom is typically highly practical, it's based off something that we want to know about, but it's not always based on science. Now, I, my illustration here is folk wisdom that was passed on to me at about fifth or sixth or seventh grade that Mountain Dew makes you, makes you infertile, right? That Mountain Dew kills your sperm count and that's why as teenagers, you never would drink, where I grew up, never drink Mountain Dew because it kills your sperm count. That's simply not true. And if you were drinking the amount of yellow dye five and or caffeine, an amount of that stuff to kill your sperm, you almost definitely would have a heart attack first, right? Mountain Dew, if you're concerned with your fertility, go ahead and keep drinking Mountain Dew, right? But that's common sense, right? That's, that's in that realm of knowledge that is common sense. But then we point that out scientifically, and that's another problem that we have as scientists, is that science doesn't always make common sense, and that creates conflict. Now, I just threw in folklore here because folklore is an element of culture and folklore is often uh, confused with folk wisdom and folk ways, so I just threw it in. Folklore is the stories of a group of people. Folklore might be fantastical, right? It might, it might be the stuff of legends and it might have been made up a long time ago, right? or it could be historical. And sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference between the, the story of the Trojan War and the existence of Troy was thought to be folklore for hundreds of years. But then in the 1940s, they discovered the actual historic city of Troy and that turned out to be real, right? Sometimes folklore involves religion. So, uh, and that's true. Um, some examples of this are Christmas characters. Uh, here we have a German Christmas witch. Sometimes witches do show up uh, around Christmas stuff. Here we have a depiction of uh, Brischneckel, who is a Pennsylvania Dutch uh, character who, um, we're gonna talk about the Pennsylvania Dutch. That's this week's culture of the week is the Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, Brischnickel, uh, he comes out of the woods, uh, he's a wild man, and if you've been good, uh, he will leave nuts in your shoes, and if you've been bad, he will beat you with a stick or some sort of wooden implement, and uh, he sometimes will, uh, so basically dads, well, usually dads, because dads do this kind of garbage, they'll like wrap with little sticks outside the bedroom uh, windows of kids, basically to scare them because old timey cultures really loved scaring the hell out of children <laughs> a lot more than we do today. Um, another good example is uh, Black Peter, which is way screwed up. So uh, the Dutch, uh, as in people from the Netherlands, not the Pennsylvania Dutch, different groups of people, the Dutch have a weird, weird, weird tradition of Santa Claus being accompanied by this character known as Black Peter, who absolutely, that is blackface. That is a white dude dressed up as a black man. And uh, there's a really amazing essay by uh, the uh, satirist David Sedaris uh, called Six to Eight Black Men, because uh, Black Peter might just be one guy or depending on the story, uh, Santa Claus has like six to eight black guys hanging out with him, right? And absolutely, if you look at the history of it, they were his slaves in past times, right? Very screwed up stuff, but the tradition will kind of exist in the Netherlands. Um, and it is luckily in our society laughable, but, um, and I, I you know, I haven't really looked into uh, that tradition since Black Lives Matter has really started making a difference. Um, 
Hopefully it's going to kind of go away, but people don't like to change how they celebrate Christmas. If you're familiar at all with Krampus traditions within uh, Europe, uh, the whole Berschnekel and the Christmas witch stuff, that is tied in with uh, Krampus traditions as well. Anyway, a dominant culture. So these are distinctions of kinds of culture, right? A dominant culture is the culture of a group of people in society with the most power, right? The dominant culture is sometimes mistaken for just general culture, right? Sometimes it is, but you might even say something like, there is no dominant culture in the United States, it's just general culture. No. So if you look at, especially old fashioned, but even to this day, depictions of the 4th of July, a holiday that should be a celebration of all Americans, you see overwhelmingly white culture in 4th of July celebration materials, right? Because wh white middle class culture is, it's, it's the, our dominant culture is what it is. And you don't, when you see depictions of culture, you often don't see working class or poor culture either, because we are a middle class and upper middle class and rich people. Those are the people whose cultures get depicted, not poor and working class people too, right? Uh, it's overwhelmingly white, it's overwhelmingly middle class or higher. You see a difference there. We, there's a slight difference, right? So. This Willie Nelson's 4th of July picnic, it's kind of a little bit different, right? It's, it's kind of a celebration of working class culture. It is kind of, it's also a celebration of cannabis culture, right? It's not quite the same thing as this uh, depiction of, um, of uh, this kind of mainstream traditional 4th of July culture. And I actually, I tried uh, Google searching uh, 4th of July black culture, and I overwhelmingly got black and white pictures of 4th of July picnics. Uh, it's, it was a very interesting kind of thing. Now you can have a conversation of, uh, well, what does that mean? Uh, and uh, I saw when I was digging through there, some conversations about things like Juneteenth right, and the actual celebration of the emancipation of the final slaves, right, and that's, that's a very interesting element. I found it actually quite difficult to find pictures of, um, of black people in Fourth of July celebrations, and we really could have a very meaningful conversation about that, uh, but we will be addressing those sorts of things when we talk about race later in the semester. I'm not just glazing over it. Uh, we will get to that sort of thing. Uh, so, that's the dominant culture, then we have subculture. A subculture is a smaller group of people with their own set of cultural styles, values, arts. They have their own culture that's different than the dominant culture. Uh, hockey has kind of this secondary status in the United States. There aren't as many hockey fans in the in the United States, as they are football fans, as they are baseball fans, etc. Uh, it, it's sort of similar to soccer in terms of fan base, but not quite. Uh, now, a specific subculture in the United States are Detroit Red Wings fans. Can anyone tell me, uh, turn on your mic and tell me what is a hat trick in hockey? Anyone know what a hat trick is? I do. Sure. What is it? Three points in a game. Three points in a game. And what do you do with a hat trick as a fan? Throw your hat. Yeah, you throw your hat on the ice. Right. That's, that's what most of the NHL does with that. Now, specifically subculturally in Detroit, when the Detroit Red Wings score a hat trick, a one player, by the way, has to score three goals, they are encouraged to throw squid octopuses on the ice, right? That's part of their cultural knowledge is to throw a preferably living octopus on the ice, right? That intensely gross act, 
right? That's, that's part of their subcultural knowledge. And that is based off of a um, eight game winning streak, I believe that occurred back in the 1950s, right? Really, really wild kind of thing that does not match up with mainstream American culture of say not throwing living animals on the ice where they will probably die, right? But ugh, ah, nasty. Another uh, example is uh, uh, among Trekkies, or they sometimes call themselves Trekkers, right? Star Trek fans. They have developed a distinct cult subcultural set of knowledges and preference and that sort of thing. You will note with both of these groups, Trekkies, Detroit Red Wings fans, surfers, um, uh, fish, eh, well, not as much, surfers. There are a lot of groups in our society that have, that they just exist and that are just subcultures, right? They are not calling into question. They're not fighting with the dominant culture. They're not fighting with the great greater culture. They're not trying to overthrow the government or, or whatever, right? They just coexist. And that's a subculture. Now a counterculture is a culture that exists in direct opposition to the dominant culture. And a counterculture may be conservative or may be progressive, right? It doesn't matter what their political affiliation is. It can go across the gamut. These are all called countercultures. Countercultures also don't necessarily have to be political, even though they often are political. Um, countercultures or subcultures may move into the dominant culture. So, and I'll talk about that in a second. Here we see countercultural albums uh, produced in punk rock. Punk rock is a musical form, but it is also a very countercultural music form. Uh, Anti Flag was saying, fuck the police for decades before it, anyone was saying it. Right, and Anti Flag uh, and the Rock Against Bush album were that came out in the early 2000s were calling into question the justification of the Iraq War, of our military actions after 9 11, in a time when you were considered to be a terrorist for questioning, for, for even possessing something that said that you were against Bush. I really can't emphasize how weird of a time that was. Uh, Pussy Riot, if you've ever heard of them, you have heard uh, out of, um, they're a Russian punk rock band that has been arrested and done prison time repeatedly for opposing uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. And um, there, there's any sort of uh, linguistic difference. Uh, that uh, Pussy is also a vulgar word in Russian as well. It effectively is an, it, it means basically the same thing uh, if you're talking about slang for uh, genitalia. Um, and uh, Pussy Riot, they're intentionally controversial. They're intentionally in your face. They're intentionally questioning the dominant culture of Russian society. Um, and they're actually a really good band too. Now here are three in terms. We're not talking about countercultures anymore. We have the terms of cultural diffusion, cultural appropriation, and transculturalism. These are three very similar terms that are hard. There, it's a spectrum of things. Cultural diffusion occurs when cultural elements spread from one group to another, right? So, yeah, I'll go over each of these. Cultural appropriation occurs when the dominant culture takes cultural elements as their own culture. And then transculturalism occurs when the of adopted cultural result in new cultural forms. Now, you can have a lot of conversations about respect surrounding diffusion, appropriation, and transculturalism, right? 
especially in the United States, you can, we can have all kinds of conversations, uh, but I'm especially intrigued by uh, ones surrounding uh, Mexican culture, Latino culture. Part of that is because of my relationship with New Mexico. And um, we see surrounding Halloween, uh, because the Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos, is so close to Halloween, often Americans will think that it is okay to dress up as sugar skull characters, this type of skeleton for Halloween. And I actually found this on Spirit Halloween site, this sugar skull um, costume, right? Well, that, from my uh, observation as a social scientist, that's a pretty damn good uh, example of cultural appropriation is taking that thing from another society and using it as if it is a Halloween decoration, right? It's not a Halloween decoration. Day of the Dead is a Mexican semi-religious holiday. It's not supposed to be used that way, right? Now, over to tacos. Tacos are a delicious food for the whole family, right? That's what tacos are. And they have tacos in, in Northern United States. They have tacos in the state of Maine, right? Tacos have moved across the country over the decades to become diffused, right? They diffused over the country. There are very, very few Latinos in the state of Maine, right? But they absolutely have tacos, right? That's cultural diffusion. And then though, you go to Taco Bell and you have all of these delicious abominations, right? All of these things that, uh, that the toasted, the toasted cheddar chalupa is in no way, it's, it's something else. It's, it's something uniquely and beautifully American that is also an example of transculturalism, right? That's what, that's what, that's what Taco Bell is in all of its beautiful horror, right? Is, is that. Please only eat it once a week. Um, does that make sense? Any questions about those, those three things? Now, I once had a student say to me, what does that mean I can't dress up like a skeleton? And this was one of the students that I was very close to almost kicking out of my class. He was just trying to be a jerk. Well, no. It also doesn't mean that you can't dress up as a sugar skull skeleton as if it were Day of the Dead, but people also then would be justified in thinking you're an asshole, right? I mean, that's, that's that, right. It's, it's not cool. No one's saying you're not allowed to do it, but it's, it's just disrespectful of that culture, right? That, that's the thing. Um, I, when I, regrettably, uh, when I was in college, I wore uh, a headband for a while that of it, there's a, a flag. It's a red, green, and black flag. It's the Pan-African flag, right? It's, it's like a black power flag. And I wore that for a while in college. That was absolutely cultural appropriation. That was something I should not have done. I, <laughs> that was not cool. And I admit to that being not cool. So let's talk a bit about some concepts we use to understand culture. So the history of social science is problematic. We've done some messed up things over time. Uh, early anthropology is filled with racist assumptions. And if you wanna dig into the racist past of anthropology, there is actually a really good section in your textbook of past examinations of like the things in anthropology that were busted. Uh, this book, this picture was uh, from the 1800s. It was a catalog of different groups of people. If you could see the wording here, some of them are outright racial slurs and they're just, and this one 
is probably the best drawn and the least insulting. This is showing progression of European evolution. Uh, this one, I guess, is probably Native American. This one's probably black, and this one's probably Asian. It's all really gross. It's really super stuff, right? And um, we, we've come a long way as social scientists. Uh, early sociology was uh, filled with assumptions that white men were, quote, neutral subjects. So when we were doing more experimentation as a discipline, we always picked white college educated males as being the neutral. And we didn't learn a whole lot because of that, because we're always looking at the same group of people. Um, early psychology placed weird emphasis on sex and that women were women and straight non heterosexual men were basically had all these different psychological problems compared to white men um, in really messed up ways. Why am I bringing this up? Well, even though these early science, social scientific ways, we did a bunch of bad stuff. The disciplines as they exist today would not have been possible without those early studies, right? Because they did bad stuff, but they also found some good stuff. And what we have to do as social scientists is deal with that is try to make up for the bad stuff, not dismiss it, not say that it wasn't really messed up, but try to move forward with it. A lot of the same way as our whole society does, right? The United States was built with slave labor, right? Some of the biggest buildings in our country were built by people who were kidnapped and enslaved. We need to deal with that. It's a similar kind of thing that we have in the social sciences. And a key example of this kind of thing of some brilliant ideas were had and some messed up things happened is this guy named Auguste Comte. So over the next couple of minutes, we're going to be talking about uh, Auguste Comte. So Auguste Comte was a French revolutionary. He was a philosopher, and he was also a weirdo of note. He was really a guy that was, he was very much a visionary. He had, he had these ideas that were way ahead of their time. He was also kind of strange. He was incredibly influential in the philosophical basis of modern science. He was one of the first ones that gave this idea of what is now called positivism that every rationally justifiable assertion can be scientifically verified or is capable of logical or mathematical proof, right? So that's, that's, that positivism, that is the philosophy that backs up science, right? If you can prove it, if you can show evidence of it, then it must be true. That's positivism, that's science. Therefore, Comte rejected metaphysics and theism, right? He really was very much the kind of character that we see in modern society of the atheist who will only accept science as being anything near truth and anything that is religion or not absolutely science as being bullshit. That it's that it's kind of an uh, that kind of perspective that very much was the thinking of Comte, but it was also the thinking of a lot of learned people during that era. I'll talk about that scientific bit in a second. Now, Comte is often called the father of sociology, and that is a wrong claim. Comte made up the word sociology. That's true. He made up the word, but he was not the father of sociology. Comte was uh, greatly influential in creating what would become sociology. One second, guys. He was influential in the discipline that would become, but uh, he uh, he, he didn't really make, he didn't really ever do sociology. His vision of sociology was very different. For example, one second. Comte wanted to apply these positivist principles 
to his study of human society. And he called that sociology, right? That was his whole idea of apply science ideas to studying society. That's, that's something we do in sociology, right? Modern sociology does do that. But he wanted to create sociology as a discipline that would replace religion. We do not do that. We absolutely do not do that. That's actually something that actually would be deeply unethical in terms of modern sociology. So anticipated that sociological principles would be able to be applied to studying ants and other animals that live together. You could study ants, you could study wolves, you could study fish, he thought, by applying sociological principles. That's simply not true but that's what he, right? The point of those examples is to show that that word sociology, but it was not what the modern day. But why was Comte so anti-religion? Well, Comte grew up shortly after the first, first French Revolution, right? So, uh, Similarly, that you guys, most of you grew up after 9-11, he grew up after the French Revolution, right? And your life was different because you grew up after 9-11, uh, and his life was different as he grew up after the French Revolution. Before the French Revolution, the aristocracy routinely used religion to oppress the population and justify their privileged position, right? So for hundreds of years prior to the French Revolution, the aristocracy, the kings, the queens, the dukes, and all those jerks were using religion as a way to keep the common people down, right? So once the revolutions of the French Revolution, the revolutions of 1848 across Europe, once all of these things sprung up, and they were able to overthrow the aristocracies, there was a real common opinion in, in Europe for a long time. Screw religion, we don't need that noise. It doesn't need to exist and it's bullshit, right? That was basically their attitude. And that was the official attitude of science for a super long time. And then eventually in the mid 20th century, we, as social scientists, we started to, we, we observed that actually religion can be used to help liberate people. And it can be used to help actually cause revolutions, right? And fix things, right? And so that attitude of religion is never good and religion is always used to oppress people, it, it changed over time. And luckily it changed over time in a way that we, there was scientific proof that that attitude was messed up, right? And it hurt people's feelings. It wasn't cool. It doesn't honor our ancestors, all that stuff, right? That's, but, but there definitely is a history of anti-religion in science, in social sciences, but that is not, that's not what we are today. Actually, it, like I said, it would be deeply unethical to be like that uh, as a social scientist today, because you can't study someone without, or a group of people, without understanding their religion or understanding that as part of their worldview. Now, Comte proposed, and there is something to this, right? So Comte was deeply anti-religious in a way that could actually be considered discriminatory but he made some really interesting points. So religion, uh, Comte proposed that the way we develop social thought is by first having religion, and then religion was replaced by magic, and then magic was replaced by science. And there is a certain, there is a certain element of truth to this, but this also is not backed up um, entirely by modern social scientific research. So his idea was, remember, he was a philosopher, not a scientist, that humanity does not understand the world. So when we are like that, we pray to gods in an effort to control our environment. That's where he thought mankind started, right? That we would pray to, to higher powers to fix what's happening here because we were powerless, right? 
An example is a child gets sick, parents make a sacrifice to the gods to make the child better. Their understanding would be that if the gods are pleased by the sacrifice, the child would get better. The scientific understanding is that the sacrifice thing to do with the child recovering, but the child could recover on their own, right? That's kind of where Kant was thinking. Then we have magic. Kant thought that once we moved into the phase, that humanity has some understanding of the world, and the difference between magic and religion is that the magic practitioner can do some things to control their environment, right? But they don't necessarily understand the nature of those things, and they don't need to necessarily understand how it works. So an example, a child gets sick. Parents take the child to a magical healer. The healer rubs magic herbs on the child. The parent's understanding, maybe the healer's understanding, is that if the magic is powerful enough, the child will recover. The scientific understanding there is that the herbs may actually have medicinal qualities that might assist the healing of the child, right? So there is something to that, those magical practices, even if the people don't necessarily understand how it worked. And then finally, we enter the science stage. Humanity has a better understanding of the world. We do things to control our surroundings. We understand how they work. The child gets sick. The parents go to the doctor. The doctor gives medicine that is scientifically proven to kill the infection in the child, right? Their understanding is that parents might not necessarily understand how the medicine underworks, under how it works, but they have a general understanding, right? They understand this is a bacterial infection because the parents are well-educated. Bacterial infection takes the antibiotic. Antibiotic kills the bacterial infection, right? Uh, scientific understanding is doctors apply medicine because it's been tested to be safe and effective, right? So basically, the parents and the, the practitioner are basically on the same page because we do have that element of democracy within uh, science, right? Because when we have scientific society, we share that knowledge with each other. Now, with all of that said, this makes a whole lot of sense, but it doesn't explain everything. If Comte was right, right? If he was right, by now, almost 200 years after, yeah, we're really close to 200 years after Comte, 200 years after him, he would have expected there to be no religion in our society anymore, there to be no magic in our society anymore, even though there are magical practitioners in our society, there are magical practitioners in a lot of places around the world. He wouldn't expect that to still happen. Why there still is religion in the world and what that religion means to people and the meaning it gives to their lives, that's a really super big question within the social sciences right, and how that changes people's behaviors. That's a, that's a big, big, interesting, juicy question, right? That's a really interesting thing. And um, we'll get into that. Now, a modern understanding of Comte is that he was very important in established scientific principles, but science is not the only way to understand the world, right? And Comte was intensely dismissive of non-European cultures, right? He was, he was straight up racist. He thought that Europe, European culture was, uh, was superior to all other cultures. He very much was a believer in spreading of uh, European culture around the world. And if all people around the world accepted European culture, accepted European versions of scientific thinking, not necessarily the scientific thinking that existed in Asia, that existed in the Middle East, that existed basically all over the world also, 
right? But they had to take the white people way of doing it, right? It was, and, and it wasn't just Comte, it was very much his scientific society at the time that they all believed that way. Okay, any questions before we go into our culture of the week? Let me see what time it is. Cool. So, our culture of the week are the Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, I am actually um, Pennsylvania Dutch. My, I'm, uh, my heritage is Pennsylvania Dutch. And not only is this a culture I know a lot about and I'm highly knowledgeable about, uh, but also the Pennsylvania comparison of Pennsylvania Dutch culture with general American culture uh, illustrates a lot of these concepts that we talked about this week. And where's my power? Come on, PowerPoint. Let's go. There we are. Uh, we're not all Amish. That's one thing people don't know about the Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, most Pennsylvania Dutch people are not Amish. Um, these are my uh, great grandparents. Uh, even though they did have an affinity for plaid, they were not Amish. They were very much modern people of their era. This was taken, I think, in the 1960s. Um, not all Amish, all, okay, here's the Venn diagrams, right? All Amish people are Pennsylvania Dutch because Amish is a community within the Pennsylvania Dutch, but not all Pennsylvania Dutch are Amish, right? Uh, the Amish are a specific religious sect, a specific religious group, and they are actually a type of Anabaptist Protestant. Uh, I will not test you on the beliefs of Anabaptists, right? But uh, the Amish are a type of Protestant, they're a type of Christian, right? However, with that said, my uh, great-grandparents uh, were not Amish. I do have distant relatives that were actually Amish. These, uh, this is from, from a genealogy book uh, that uh, some distant relatives put together, and this is a picture of uh, some of my uh, Amish relatives. So, like, there was carryover. There were, uh, yeah. The food of the Pennsylvania Germans, because we are Pennsylvania Dutch of German descent, right? The reason we're called Dutch is that's a um, corruption of the word Deitch. Deitch means, well, in, in the language of the Pennsylvania Dutch, Deitch means German. Deitch is, is the name of uh, the language, the Pennsylvania Dutch language. There actually is a Pennsylvania Dutch language. I'll share a little bit of that with you in a second. The food of the Pennsylvania Germans is very interesting in terms of cultural diffusion and appropriation. The food, some of the foods that we consider to be very American are actually Pennsylvania Dutch foods, such as apple pie. The American apple pie is as Pennsylvania Dutch as it gets. Uh, shoe fly pie might not be something that you know so much about. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. A lot of candies, Pennsylvania Dutch are often associated with candies. There are often candy displays. It says Pennsylvania Dutch candy. Uh, and then they show like Twizzlers. So like, we didn't make Twizzlers. Um, and sausages and other American type foods. Now, this is actually, feel free to uh, make this pie, I suppose, if you want. This is my grandmother's uh, shoe fly pie recipe. Uh, shoe fly pie is a kind of, it's basically sugar pie is what it is. It's a, it's a kind of, it's just a very sugary pie. Uh, it's gooey, it's actually really good. Um, this recipe calls for a quarter cup sugar, a quarter cup flour, three quarter cups brown sugar, one cup molasses, one egg, hot water, baking soda. Now, can anyone tell me what king syrup is? Anyone know? Probably not. Because probably unless you have experience with uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, you probably don't know. King syrup is high fructose corn syrup. It's bottled high fructose corn syrup. It's about the most American thing there is, is liquid sugar, right? Now, so this, my grandmother's 
shoe fly pie recipe is not quote unquote authentic because it it uses high fructose corn syrup instead of molasses, right? Because I learned this because I tried to make this pie with traditional molasses, which is not fructose corn syrup, and it made the nastiest pie I've ever eaten in my life. It was it tasted like charcoal? It was nasty because. In about the mid 50s, somewhere, my family decided to swap out molasses, which does have a pretty distinct flavor to it. It's a, it's, it's a more adult flavor for king syrup because the damn kids weren't eating the shoe fly pie mom was making, right? So, so you, you kick up the sugar, right? So you make it less of an adult flavor, more of kids flavors. And that's very much of a, a thing that happened in American society uh, during that era. The Pennsylvania Dutch, we have our own language. It's called Deitch. It's sometimes called Pennsylvania Deitch, right? It is a distinct type of German. It, uh, but it is its own language, right? Uh, and, and you see this around the world. The newer languages like uh, Afrikaans. Afrikaans is a version of German also spoken by people in South Africa. People in South Africa, they speak their own version of, it's their own language. Um, if you speak German, you would understand most of it. So if you were a German speaker, uh, you would be able to more or less understand someone, someone speaking Deutsch, but you wouldn't necessarily understand all the words. Uh, it is often used, like many languages, uh, to distinguish outsiders from insiders, right? So even people that... Um, the, the, the basically the code, the way you say, do you speak Pennsylvania Dutch to someone to know if they're fully fluent is to ask the question, uh, what is it? It's, uh, do your words attract flies? That's what we say. Uh, do your words attract flies? You say it in the Pennsylvania Dutch way. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't know how to say that uh, because my, my grandmother uh, and her siblings were the last people in our family to speak Pennsylvania Dutch. But the thinking there is because it's such a beautifully sweet language that it would attract flies. Uh, and that's the kind of corny humor of the Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, it uh, was widely spoken in Pennsylvania on, until World War II. Uh, prior to that top moment in history, um, we were very widely spoke our language amongst each other, uh, but because of World War II, uh, we, um, we, we dropped it because we were being discriminated against because, you know, we were German speakers and we weren't, and it, it, it was really messed up. And because of that, uh, we didn't speak our own language anymore. Um, that's why I, I don't speak Pennsylvania Dutch because it was lost. It was never taught to me. I only found out as an adult that the way my grandmother spoke was because her first language was Deutsch and she learned how to speak English later on. My grandmother spoke with an accent. I thought that's just how grandma spoke, right? Um, and so here I have a clip, a YouTube clip of um, a guy talking about Pennsylvania Dutch. This might, let me, I might have to. One second. Of course. One thing Zoom really hates. Zoom just hates PowerPoint so much. One second. And in this, you're going to hear not only the Pennsylvania Dutch language, but you're going to hear the accent of those who are the ancestors of the Pennsylvania Dutch, which I find very interesting. Because, um, yeah, so, and that's linguistically very interesting. If you know anyone, for example, that was brought up by someone who, um, an English person, right? Someone who grew up in England, uh, often uh, those people will have a slight British accent, 
right? And that's because they learned to speak the language like it was at home, right? So if you were brought up by a person who uh, spoke Pennsylvania, right, but they didn't speak it to you growing up, that was not the language of your ancestors, then uh, then you would speak in a certain way. You would make certain enunciations in a certain way. You wouldn't necessarily, like, it, 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 it changes. It changes the way you talk a little bit. You see that? You also see a very authentic show of the very pure hatred that the Pennsylvania Dutch have for the Nazis because it's like a deep ancestral thing. We were not deep, uh, effectively persecuted, but we were our, our lives were made very difficult by by association with those rat bastards, right? So you see that here too, which I think is very interesting. So I'm going to have to change my screen sharing to allow for the volume on this clip. And I think this is very this is very interesting. Kannst du die Schwätze? Can you speak Pennsylvania German? You probably can't, because if you can, you're an Am Amish or Mennonite and don't have access to the internet. However, there are some people who aren't Amish or Mennonite who can. As for me, ich kann just ein bisschen Schwätze. I can only speak a little bit, but I'm learning. And hopefully through these videos I can help other people learn. Once upon a time in Pennsylvania, say not even that long ago, 1939, for example, one third of the nine million people in Pennsylvania, especially in rural Pennsylvania, spoke Pennsylvania German or Deutsch as their first language, Erschspruch. And unfortunately, because of the fucking Nazis, excuse me, uh, it became almost a crime or humiliating to speak Pennsylvania German anymore. And the generations of Pennsylvania Dutch stopped teaching their, their, uh, the next generations how to speak it, with the exception of the Amish and Mennonites. So I hope through these videos to give a little insight into the Pennsylvania German language. I have a partner in this undertaking, a Mitschaffer from me, a co-worker of mine who is Amish, John Ebersall. For the first installment, we are going to, uh, well, I give him a ride every day to and from work. And we talk in German every day, and that's how I learn partially. I also am going to Kutztown University, and I'm minoring in Pennsylvania German at the moment. A little bit about myself. My name is Lee, Lee Hearn. Uh, I have a huge, I love history and I love languages and my specific interest in Germanic languages began when I was 19, I'm now 26. I lived in Austria for a year and worked in a lumberyard and I've met so many friends there. I also worked in Switzerland and Basel for a month and in, uh, in Baden in Germany for three months as well. And there I learned a little bit about German dialects as well as high German. I took some classes. And then when I came back, I worked with three Amishmen and I used the German I learned there. And it just fascinated me that here in Pennsylvania, we have a Germanic dialect that has survived to this day, even if there is a lot of English mixed in. Um, whereas America is a country of immigrants, most of them became Americanized and Italians, Polish, they gave up, they gave up their language, if not their customs. However, the Pennsylvania Germans managed to hold on to their, their language, even if it mutated and developed over time. So we're going to look into that and I'm going to try some methods that are maybe hopefully interesting and can help. And as you can see, I'm in the Pennsylvania countryside, I will also try to showcase some of the prettier parts of rural Pennsylvania as well and sorry I have my hood up but it's fucking cold outside and uh, excuse my language but you also might learn from me how we speak English in Pennsylvania and probably the proper way is not to speak English because uh, 
anyway, moving on. I hope you enjoy. So yeah, it's, I'm really very interested in the Eastern Pennsylvania uh, accent too, because it is, it is very heavily influenced by uh, Pennsylvania German. Uh, Western Pennsylvania has its own set. It's just unique ways of speaking too that are a different thing. Um, moving on though. Do you guys see, see my PowerPoint now? So yeah, I'll just use this then because uh, we only have a couple slides left. So religion. Oh, this is actually, I'm gonna go back into full, full slide version because this is super interesting too. And this is something a lot of uh, very conservative religious people in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania don't e refuse to acknowledge or don't know even. The Pen Pennsylvania Dutch are primarily Christian, right? Uh, they are a lot of sense. Uh, Lutherans, Mennonites, Anabaptists. Uh, there are some Catholics, not many, but there are some Catholics or other Christians. There are a whole lot of Christians among the Pennsylvania Dutch, and a lot of them are um, what you would classify as being pretty conservative Christians at that. Uh, Mennonites, uh, Mennonites are also part of that as well. Um, yeah. Now, and others, what's in that other category? Well, most of the people known as Pennsylvania Dutch came from the Rhine region of what is now Germany after the Thirty Years' War. So this area right here, it's important to remember that Germany was not this whole area, right? This is modern Germany, but a number of very small kingdoms uh, during this era. So during the Thirty Years' War, which was effectively a massive world war between Protestants and Catholics, this area of the Rhine was decimated and just, just it, was, it was an absolute war zone. It was as bad of a war zone as you see in many of the areas we think of as being war-torn in the United States, States today, in the world today, like very much like Iraq was in the early 2000s, right? No rebuild, like it was, it was flattened. Now, the Thirty Years' War coincided with a time that is sometimes called the Burning Times. This is a period from 1580 to 1630, which marked one of the final and most vicious persecutions of pagan belief in Europe, right? So thus, some of the people who fled the migration of the Pennsylvania Germans were likely pagan, right? Which is super, super interesting. I am so interested in uh, those elements of history that are the lost histories of oppressed people. I think that's super, super duper interesting. So yeah, now, now given this phrase, the burning times is sometimes used uh, really loosely by uh, modern neo-pagans. I had conversations with friends about this earlier this week. Uh, some of them think the term the burning times is just like all political nonsense. Uh, but there de definitely this era of 1580 to 1630 uh, was very much like the last of the witch burnings in Europe kind of time. Now, let's define these terms. Pagan and heal heathen. These are the traditional beliefs of the ancient Europeans. These are typified by the worship and celebration of multiple gods, of ancestors, and or of nature spirits, right? It was the pre-Christian religious beliefs of the European people. These, this original belief system were, <laughs> that's as irradiated. No, eradicated is what I mean it to say, not irradiated. They didn't have nuclear weapons. They were eradicated by uh, Christian churches. And those who attempt to recreate those beliefs in the modern day are called neo-pagans, right? There are no pagans left. There are only neo-pagans because many neo-pagans attempt to recreate traditions of the original pagans, but an amazing amount was lost between this modern day and the hundreds of years when it was very, very dangerous to be a pagan, 
right? So in those last days, in the late 1600s, there's pretty good anthropological evidence to show that there was at least some sorry, it's surviving pagans that came over the uh, mass migration of the people who would become Pennsylvania. And our main piece of evidence for this is this highly developed state of folk magic, which is a type of folk wisdom. We talked about that among Pennsylvania Germans. It adds credibility to the fleeing pagans hypothesis, right? Not only were books of spells common, people fell books, but they were even published, which is wild. The most popular of these was John Homan's The Long Lost Friend. And if you, you can actually find this book on uh, Amazon uh, very easily, it's like 10 bucks. Uh, the wording of many of these spells were distinctly Christian, but there is definitely indications to older pagan traditions as well. And uh, among those fundamentalist Christians, uh, some of my relatives among them, and if you're a fundamentalist Christian, that's totally cool. We're, we can all be cool in the world. But, but among some people, they think that this type of magic is absolutely the thing of the devil, right? That's the, the common modern perception of fundamentalist Christianity. But these magical, relig magical beliefs... I just find it to be deeply fascinating. Hex signs, which are another symbol of the Pennsylvania Dutch, also indicate this uh, hidden pagan past to the Pennsylvania Dutch. It's one of the most visible symbols that the Pennsylvania Dutch have are the hex signs. Um, I actually I have my phone right here. I have a hex sign um, sticker on the back of my phone. Uh, right there. That's what that is. You, you find that on the bat, on a barn most typically. Um, most of the visible symbols of the Pennsylvania Dutch are the hex signs in German as well as in Dutch. Uh, hex means spell and a hexa is a witch, right? So the, the, the plan right there. Now it should be uh, it should be indicated that the Amish do not approve of hex signs and it's not necessarily that they don't Believe, it's not like the magical component to it, and there is some uh, evidence to show that people would hang up various hex signs for magical reasons, uh, but it's because the Amish do not believe in vanity to the extreme, right? That's why they all dress the same, that's why they have the same houses, is because they think is very, very bad, and they think hard work is very, very good, right? So that's why they don't have a car take a ride in a car because they think that you the, the the work necessary to making a horse go is a good thing um yeah the hex signs we you see double um double birds uh this is uh what's this called um a distal distal think distal think is an imaginary bird uh, that's thought to bring good luck, and if you put two of them, it's double good luck. And here we have horses. A horse is a show, a symbol of strength. So if you have a double horse, you have double strength, right? Uh, here we have a, another Disselfink or uh, bird, uh, Amrock, to signify good luck. Uh, you see the Willkommen, uh, which is uh, a Deutsch for welcome. Uh, you see these six points uh, and combinations of three, uh, probably to uh, signify uh, the uh, Holy Trinity because it is tied in uh, with uh, Christian religiosity as well. Uh, and then uh, six hearts um, to signify love and caring and all that. Um, the hex signs, uh, some do definitely say that they are just decoration. Others say they are remnants of very old folk magical traditions. Uh, the, tr the true meaning of the signs 
uh, remained and in some places still remain hidden for fear of persecution from fundamentalist Christians, uh, which still is a valid concern. I can't, I have a, uh, actually it occurs every Labor Day, but it's not happening this year, thank goodness. Uh, we have a uh, family reunion and I know that if I brought up my interest in this stuff, that I would uh, definitely, it would make easy conversations among my more traditional uh, relatives. Uh, but here we see a example of uh, hex signs on a barn. And why were they always on barns? Because barns were super important. That's where your stuff was that was valuable, right? So of course you would have protection symbols on the barns to, to make sure everything stayed safe. Uh, to this day, many Pennsylvania Dutch deny the connections between the traditional pagan and he uh, heathen beliefs and magical signs, as well as the other magical traditions. We have a very deep magical tradition within uh, Pennsylvania Dutch society, and a lot of the people of that are younger than my grandparents' generation don't even know about it. If I asked my mom about this stuff, she would have no idea. She wouldn't even know what I was talking about. Um, so yeah, that that is uh, that stuff. Any questions there? I am probably going to include some stuff from the culture of the week uh, in the exam materials only because we're going to have one of every week. I might use it in a way that just gives us illustrations to the greater concept, right? I'm very big on vocab in, um, in teaching and learning, so there's going to be a lot of vocabulary on the exam. That's your study uh, tip for the evening. Um, any questions on any of this or anything else relating to class or anything we've gone over? This is me asking that question right before I'm about ready to end the class. So any final questions? Are you going to post the PowerPoints by itself without the recording? Yes, I will. I will do that. Um, the way I usually do that is I will make a, um, a folder on the side of uh, Blackboard is how I'll do that. Yeah, good question. Anything else? No? no? Okay, the faces I see look pretty tired and ready to go. You made it through a three-hour Zoom lecture. If this is your first time on Zoom, I guess welcome to the wild and horrible world of Zoom. And um, Okay, cool. We're ready to go. Good job. Good luck this week. Uh, if you have questions on anything, let me know. Um, I'm doing my best to keep up with emails, but I have six schools to contend with. Um, also, keep in mind that I do have uh, office hours on Wednesdays that you can tune into uh, if you have more applied questions. So, I will call it an evening at this point, and uh, Anna, go watch some something. Okay. See you later.